And just before we get into the video today, this video is actually a collaboration with Pilot Photog, who provided the stunning animations for this video for you to enjoy. If you want to check out more from him and his video about the Dorito, well, it's linked below. I hope you enjoy today's enhanced visuals and, well, hopefully, more to come. It's December the 17th, 1998, on the second night of the United States airstrike known as Operation Desert Fox. You're a guard at one of Saddam Hussein's many, many palaces, and you've got a sneaking suspicion that this palace might not last the night. Damn right. You've heard about what happened last night, the wreckage and destruction that took place in other parts of your country, and since dear old Saddam has decided not to back down, tonight is almost sure to be worse. As you wait, you can't help but wonder what sort of American jets will be flying overhead soon. Perhaps their supersonic bomber or, or one of what seems like a thousand sorts of fancy fighter jets. But when you finally see the plane that's coming for you, you're barely able to believe your eyes. On the one hand, it's got all the eerie contours and otherworldly design of an alien spacecraft, and on the other, well, it looks for all the world like a corn chip. As the A-12 Avenger 2 puts an absolute beating on your boss's palace and your friend over in radar operations bemoans the fact that his faulty radar never saw these planes coming, you get a sinking feeling that you've entered an age where this new strange jet is going to be ruling the skies. But of course that's only what might have been. Because even as innovative, even as wild looking as the A-12 Avenger 2 was, it was never to be. In today's episode of Mega Projects, we're going to explore the one-of-a-kind plane in all its detail and really go deep on the A-12 Avenger, the futuristic flying Dorito of death that, well, never made it to the big time. So good attack aircraft can be a game changer in a battle, flying low over a war zone and unleashing instant destruction on entrenched enemy forces that might have taken hours to destroy using land-based means. But a great attack aircraft is a lot more than that. Versatile, easy to maintain in austere environments, and extremely durable. Planes like the American A-10 and the Soviet Su-25, both of which we've covered on this channel previously, if you want to check those videos out after this one, I need the watch time, are a critical force multiplier in a long-term military engagement. With their help, armies or navies can surge through enemy lines in rapid succession, turning a protracted bloody war into one-way traffic for as long as it lasts. But by the early 1980s, the US Navy had a problem. They no longer had a great attack aircraft, and to hear some naval officials tell it, they didn't even have a good one. Their main attack aircraft at the time, the Grumman-made A6 Avenger, was distinguished for its long range and payload capacity, but with an initial introduction to service in 1963, the plane had become outmoded some 20 years later. The Navy needed a replacement. And although Fairchild Republic's A-10 Warthog was already proudly bursting into service in the Air Force, the airplane would have been a nightmare to design into a carrier-capable variant. Similarly, although the F-14 Tomcat was already in service, high-speed fighter aircraft like the Tomcat aren't really appropriate for a ground attack role. There's a few reasons for this, but probably the easiest to understand is that if you're going to shoot a plane's cannons or rockets at the ground, the plane's got to be pointed at the ground, and, well, that's a massive problem, and it's also terrifying for the pilot, because planes also need to stay airborne, and that involves not aiming directly at the ground. So rather than attempt to jury-rig these other planes into an attack roll, the Navy kicked off its Advanced Tactical Aircraft program, which opened up in 1983 to solicit design proposals from a range of companies. The Navy had a few things on their wish list. The eventual winning design would be able to operate at long range and carry high payloads while operating from an aircraft carrier in a medium attack role, that is to say, carrying big and very effective weapons, but not so big that you'd need a strategic bomber-sized aircraft to lift them. But the really interesting demand by the Navy was for stealth capability, which at that time was still an emerging technology. The Air Force's only real stealth aircraft at that time was the SR-71 Blackbird, which had since been outpaced by Soviet radar advances, and the F-117 Nighthawk, which had been secretly introduced to the Air Force's arsenal that year. So although the Navy's contractors would be able to draw on that knowledge, they'd have been on the cutting edge in terms of actually making stealth work at scale. 
For a project like this, none of the usual suspects within America's aircraft design community wanted to go it alone. Of the two teams that received contracts for the concept design, one was a collaboration between McDonnell Douglas, known for their F-4 and F-15, and General Dynamics, known for the F-16. The other brought together the Northrop, Grumman, and Vought companies, all with a long history of putting planes onto U.S. aircraft carriers. Initially, it was the latter team that should have had an advantage. Grumman was responsible for the A-6, the aircraft this contract was meant to replace, while Vought had produced the carrier-capable A-7 Corsair, a highly effective attack aircraft in its own right. But even though they, as well as the other team, would be awarded follow-on contracts in 1986, the Grumman Vought Northrop team never submitted a final design. McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics did, and by default, they were the winner. But it wouldn't be accurate to simply claim that the design McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics presented was chosen due to a lack of alternatives. Uncontested as the design might have been, it was also a fascinating piece of conceptual work, and one that did have the potential to redefine attack aircraft doctrine as a whole. Named the A-12 Avenger II, in homage to the Grumman-made torpedo bomber of World War II that bore the same Avenger name, the plane bore little resemblance to its namesake, or for that matter, anything else in the sky. Now, today we recognize the plane's design as a so-called flying wing, a design used in the B-2 stealth bomber, the Lockheed Martin Sentinel drone, and a range of experimental aircraft. But not only was a flying wing aircraft a fairly unproven concept in the late 1980s when the plane was chosen, but the Avenger was also fundamentally unlike any other flying wing designed before or since. Put simply, it was a triangle, with a sharply pointed nose, two sharp tipped wings, and an almost completely smooth exterior distinguished by an alien looking bubble cockpit sticking out of the front and, well, very little else. A total length, front to back, just under 38 feet or 11 and a half meters, but with a wingspan of 70 feet, that's 21 and a half meters, the A-12 was designed to be maneuverable with plenty of room for munitions and fuel payload. Powered by two General Electric turbofan engines nestled mostly inside the aircraft with intake ports just under the cockpit and exhaust vents on the underbelly, the Avenger featured an empty weight of 39,000 pounds but a maximum takeoff weight of 80,000 pounds, including 5,160 pounds of munitions. The plane was designed with an internal weapons bay with the capacity to carry two AIM-120 air-to-air missiles, two AGM-88 air-to-ground missiles, or any number of unguided or guided bombs. Some experts have even claimed that the plane was designed to carry nuclear payloads too. Early versions of the plane did not include a cannon. Between this and the lack of any external weapons hardpoints, it had what's called a low observable radar profile, meaning that its surface only contained minimal ridges and edges to deflect radar back to its source. Just to give you an idea of how important this can be, the American B-2 bomber is a pretty massive plane, but its radar cross-section, when viewed from the front, is between 0.1 and 0.5 square meters, at worst about the same size as a fairly large crow. And the rest of its capabilities were impressive too. The Avenger 2 would have flown at a top speed of about 580 miles per hour, that's 930 kilometers an hour, which is not particularly fast where fighter jets are concerned, but it's comparable to the Su-25 and it's about 140 miles per hour faster than the Warthog. More important for an attack aircraft, the Avenger 2 would have a particularly low stall speed because of its flying wing design, meaning that it could fly menacingly over a battlefield and drop its payload with a high degree of accuracy. The Avenger 2 boasted a surface ceiling of 40,000 feet, more than enough to avoid enemy anti-air weapons in most times especially combined with its low observable shape. Its combat range was perhaps most impressive of all, in comparison to a measly 288 miles for the A-10 and a somewhat better 470 miles for the Su-25, the A-12 would have boasted a range of 920 miles, more than enough to strike targets located deep inland and then return to its carrier. And finally, speaking of carriers, the A-12's short body triangular design would have meant that when its wings were folded and a whole bunch of them were parked facing each other, the Navy could have fit about five of these planes in the space that they needed for two F-14s. But that's just our quick math, so you can take it with a grain of salt. The A-12 was meant to be easy to maintain, not too difficult to fly, and was even considered for modification into a tanker variant and a dedicated anti-ship assault plane. Unorthodox, innovative, and with every indication that it would be bloody effective, the A-12 was a hit with the US military. The Navy's initial order, lacking any of the skeptical conservatism it showed some other planes of the era, was for 620 of the planes. Never one to miss out on a good time, the Marines made public their own desire for 238 of them. The design even caught the attention of the Air Force, which really should have been all set between the A-10 and the stealthy F-117 Nighthawk, but still entertained the possibility of picking up 400 Avenger 2s if an appropriate variant could be designed. 
For its strange, eerie, but at the same time perhaps somewhat silly looking shape, it earns the informal moniker the Flying Dorito. And with a first flight plan for December 1990, the program looked as if it might take off in record time. So now it's about time that you might be thinking to yourself, Packed Boy, the plane sounds fantastic. How did it not actually happen? Why did it never go ahead? And to that, we say, imagine the A-12 Avenger 2, like your drunk uncle picking a street fight. Because just like him, the A-12 went from swaggering out into the open with all the confidence in the world to being face down, bleeding all over the sidewalk in the span of about five seconds. You see, as prodigious as the A-12 might have been in battle against, say, insurgencies or enemy regimes, it was no match for the United States military's budget office, who commands such power as to control the rise and fall of empires with a single slash of their ominous red pen. It wasn't for lack of trying. High-profile naval officials, including Deputy Chief of Naval Air Operations Vice Admiral Richard Dunleavy, threw their support behind the project, and the cancellation of upgrades to the Navy's existing A-6 attack planes seemed to all but ensure that the A-12 was needed. But it simply wasn't to be. Within a few months, the A-12 had proved that its ambition had exceeded what was possible at the time. Its structure, initially intended to be built with composite materials that were supposed to make it lighter, didn't actually result in any weight savings, and some of the structural elements simply couldn't be made with composites, as McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics had hoped. Instead, they had to be replaced with standard metal components in line with what other aircraft were using. This put the aircraft's weight at over 30 tons when empty a full 30% past what had been intended and close to the absolute maximum that an aircraft carrier would be able to accommodate. The plane's avionics were slow to develop, its radar was underwhelming at best, and when taken together, all of these issues put the plane way, way over budget. In fact, it was so bad that it was estimated to consume up to 70% of the Navy's annual aircraft budget. When these issues made to the desk of Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney, they weren't exactly met with enthusiasm. Right away, 238 aircraft orders meant for the Marine Corps were slashed to zero, and expectations for the plane's production rate were dramatically lowered. The Air Force's potential buy of another 400 was postponed to 1998 at the earliest and written out of the plan for development. The Navy could keep their 620 potential craft, but they too were on thin ice. And thin ice is precisely where the Navy didn't want to be for what happened next. McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics were forced to report that their project was facing more serious engineering issues and were running over cost to the tune of $2 billion, or $4.5 billion today. Their first flight would be delayed until at least the fall of 1991, and the price per plane would have to go way up. These weren't game-ending issues for the A-12, at least not necessarily. After all, they would look like playtime in comparison to the later issues that the F-35 Lightning would face. But rather than pivot to address these emergent problems, the Navy and both design corporations relied on faulty, overly optimistic assumptions about how quickly and easily they could get everything back on track. Not only that, but they played fast and loose with the truth, even with their government superiors. In the words of reporter David Montgomery, officials assigned to Secretaries Cheney and Garrett were kept away. Standard reporting procedures were abandoned, and information was transmitted verbally rather than in writing. When the government conducted a separate inquiry into the program, it was concerned for the A-12 team's lack of objectivity and their disregard for concern voiced by financial analysts that were eventually the death knell for the Avenger. On January the 7th, 1991, the US Navy sent word to McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics. The A-12 contract was terminated. There would be no prototype, there would be no production run, and all the money the Navy had given each company would have to be returned. It was a solemn acknowledgement from the Navy. They were $2 billion in the hole and hadn't yet gotten back a single airplane. But the defense contractors hadn't helped themselves either. Rather than hurry up and deliver, they'd ask for even more money and refused to specify a concrete price or timeline for delivery of aircraft. In the aftermath of the A-12 program's cancellation, the two contractors would fight a decade-long legal battle with the government for reparations, even while they provided a range of other weapons and aircraft for them. Two Navy admirals, an Undersecretary of Defense, and a Navy captain would all lose their jobs, and the affair was a massive black eye, not just for the Navy, but for Defense Secretary Cheney too. With the A-12 gone, the Navy was left with no successor to its A-6, which would nonetheless be retired by 1997. Instead, the F-A-18 Hornet and its successor, the Super Hornet, would have to fill the role of attack aircraft. To its credit, the Hornet has kept up with the Navy's needs, despite the shortcomings involved with using a fighter plane in an attack role. By all accounts, it is a highly effective strike fighter. But for the Navy, 
The vision of a stealthy, dedicated attack aircraft went entirely unfulfilled, and even the modern F-35 multi-role fighter hasn't quite stepped into the role that the A-12 might have occupied. But alas, it simply wasn't meant to be. The Avenger 2 may have been a feat of aviation design, but it will never lead the way into battle as the Navy had once hoped. What could have been a world-changing aircraft was instead kept out of service forever by a design and engineering team that faced significant but conquerable obstacles, but chose hubris rather than dogged persistence as their preferred route forward. With that decision came the premature end of the A-12, the spooky, stealthy, and very, very formidable flying Dorito that might have changed the world.